The moon wallowed, pale and bloated on the horizon. The tide, running abnormally high even for this time of Ayun's near approach, had turned. No longer reversing the river's natural flow, it swelled and accelerated the headlong rush of waters down to the sea. Oars creaked in rusty oarlocks as a flat-bottomed rowboat, carrying a grizzled old man and a sturdy youth, headed across the current, pulling for the dark western shore. The old man sat on the stern thwart, scanning the river, while the boy rowed. At first glance they might have been mistaken for seafaring men, for they dressed much alike in cloth caps and long, full-skirted coats of some rough fabric so worn, patched, and stained that it could no longer be identified. They wore their hair in short, tarry pigtails, sailor fashion. But their pale faces gave them away, and their wide, dark eyes, like the eyes of some nocturnal bird of prey. They were river scavengers, Caleb Brown and his grandnephew Jedediah, men who slept by day and worked at night, rowing out on the river after dark when the fishing scows, barges, and pleasure craft that plied the river Lun by day were all tied up in dock. Near the middle of the river, Caleb reached out with the gaff hook to snag a piece of floating wood. It proved to be a piece of decorative molding depicting one of the seven fates a gilded figure like to a naked man with outstretched eagle's wings sprouting from its shoulders. The gold paint was beginning to flake away, giving the features a leprous cast, but the wood was still sound. With a grunt of satisfaction, Caleb dropped the molding in the bottom of the boat. When they reached quieter waters near the shore, Jedediah rowed upstream, turned the boat, and started across again. Upriver! Caleb's hoarse warning barely allowed Jed time to reverse the stroke of one oar and turn the boat so that the bow took the impact. There was a dull thud, and the boat rocked wildly as something heavy glanced against the bow and scraped along the side. Jed caught only a glimpse of a blunt-ended shadow riding low in the water and a gleam of moonlight on ornate brass fittings before the current caught the coffin and sent it bobbing on ahead. Pull, lad, pull, Uncle Caleb called out. Blister me, we'll lose it, you don't move sharp. Jed plied the oars frantically, spinning the boat 180 degrees, then rowing with all his might to get downstream of the coffin. Then it was Caleb's turn to move swiftly, using the gaff hook to draw the long black box closer, then tying ropes through two of the handles. With the coffin securely in tow, Caleb sat down again rubbing his hands on the sides of his thighs. Eben would, by the look of it, and see them fancy handles? Some fine country gentleman or a baron or a jarl inside, maybe. Should be money and jewels as well. Jed nodded glumly. If not gold coins or a jeweled brooch, the long black box would likely contain something of value. Yet at the thought of opening the coffin and claiming those valuables, he could not repress a shudder. You got no call to be so squeamish, snorted Caleb. You was bred for this life, which is more than I can say for some of the rest of us. You got no call to quake and rattle your teeth at the sight of a box of old bones. Jed knew it was so. Just about as far back as he could remember, he had been accompanying his granduncle on these nighttime expeditions. But even before that, as Caleb was fond of reminding him, he had been a dependent of the river and the tide. The very cradle that had rocked him as a baby was constructed of planks from the wreck of the Celestial Mary. His first little suit of clothes, in which he had amazed the other urchins in velvet and lace, his mother cut from the cloak of a drowned nobleman. And much of the food and drink which nourished him since had been purchased with dead man's coin. Old Lun, she was a capricious river as Jed well knew, restlessly eroding her own banks, making sudden leaps and changes in her course, especially upriver in the country districts where there were no strong river walls to contain her. Swelled by a high tide or by the rains and snowmelt of quickening, 
She swept away manors and villages, churches and farmhouses, crumbled old graveyards and flooded ancient burial vaults, dislodging the dead as ruthlessly as she evicted the living. No, the Lun respected no persons, either living or dead. But the crueler she was to others, she was that much kinder to men like Jed and his uncle Caleb. For by river rack and by sea rack brought in by the tide, off goods salvaged from waterlogged bales and salt-stained wooden chests, by an occasional bloated corpse found floating, with money still in its pockets, the scavengers gleaned a meager existence year-round, and especially when the full moon brought high tides and other disturbances, were sometimes able to live in comfort for an entire season off the grave offerings of the pious departed. Despite all that, Jed always felt a cold uneasiness robbing the dead. Willie Grauman opened a coffin once, found the body of a girl inside, her hair down to her feet and the nails on her hands more than a foot long, and the box all filled with blood. Willie says she was fair floating in it. Jed spoke over the continued creaking of the oars. It weren't a natural corpse at all. It was a bloodsucker. Willie slammed the lid down and... Willie Grauman is a liar. I thought you knowed that, said Caleb, speaking with calm authority. Jed hunched one shoulder. Erasmus Wolfhard ain't no liar. He says his granddad opened a box once, and there weren't no body at all. Just a white linen shroud and a great heaven mass of worms and yellow maggots. One of them worms crawled out and got into old Wolfhart's clothes, and while he slept that night, that worm ate a hole right through his leg, flesh and bone and all. Erasmus seen the hole hisself, or the scar anyways, and the old man limped to the end of his days. I heard another story how Carl Wolfhart lamed his leg, and it weren't nearly so romantic, Caleb replied coolly. He reached into a pocket somewhere inside the capacious folds of his coat and removed a long-stemmed pipe. Reckoning it was time for a change of subject, he said, Heard there was a quake up country. Mayhap we're not the only ones in luck this night. When Ayun drew near the earth in her elliptical orbit, the unstable country upriver was prone to seismic tremors and quakes, and sometimes it was the agitated earth, not the river, that leveled cities and towns and forests, or, in a ghastly reversal, swallowed the living as it spewed forth the dead. Oughtn't to speak of luck afore it's been proved good or ill, not afore we've learned if our fine country gentleman took a notion to curse his grave goods, Jed muttered. He remembered a time twelve weeks past, in the season of frost, when old Hagen Rugen had come into possession of a pair of solid silver candlesticks, the grave offering of a rural parson, and died not three days later of the horrors. Superstitious foolery, said Caleb, as if he could read Jed's thoughts. Hagen Rugen was a drunk and guzzled his self to death on the money he made off them candlesticks. Dead men's coin ain't no worse than any man's, he quoted. Jedediah set his jaw. Uncle Caleb was a fine one to scoff at superstition. Wasn't it superstitious foolery that brought Caleb so low in the first place? Him and that old madman at the bookshop. Aye, I, I know what powers there are to bring a man to ruin, and how he may bring his own self low with foolish schemes and crack-brained notions. Caleb spoke again, as if guessing where Jed's thoughts were leading him which, in all probability, he was, having a knack for that sort of thing. What man knows better than me? Caleb stuck the pipe in the corner of his mouth. I've lived off this river for nigh fifty years. A hard life, some would call it, but I never took no harm from it, though I took silver and gold from the dead as often as I could. No, and I never seen no bloodsuckers nor bone grinders neither. But when I lived in a fine mansion, having a respectable post as servant to the family of a Jarl, and was more than a servant, was friend and confidant to the son of that noble house, 
Then I knew something, and experienced something of powers and intelligences, and all the evil things that can blight a man's heart and twist a man's soul, and dog a man's footsteps wheresoever he might choose to go, and all with no other object than to bring him down to ruination. Caleb nodded emphatically, took the pipe out of his mouth, and tapped it on the side of the boat as if for further emphasis. When you've seen and done and suffered as much as I have, lad, then you'll be fit to say what's superstitious foolery and what's just plain tomfoolery. Until then, you'd do well to let yourself be guided by wiser heads. Jed said nothing, but continued to row.